Welcome to Econ Talk, coming to you from the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of George Mason University. You can find more Econ Talk at www.econtalk.org, along with readings and links related to this podcast. My guest today is Mike Munger of Duke University, coming to us today from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. How is it there, Mike? Well, it's terrific. I, I can say that most of the oysters are afraid of me, but otherwise things are going fine. Uh, that's an impressive achievement uh, to instill fear in an oyster. I, I didn't know you had it in you. I've, uh, I've, I'm actually trying to do an undercover investigation of the seafood industry here, so the, I think the fish are also frightened. But I do want to say that in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, competition is alive and well. The, the quality of uh, the restaurants is great. The prices are low. And you think that is? You don't think it's because they just really appreciate what a fine person you are? They anticipated me coming. At, no, actually, it can't possibly be true. So what 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 it is is that they're trying to make money, and the way to make money in markets is provide good service and charge low prices. Adam Smith had a very nice observation about markets creating virtue that way. It forces you to be, have some fellow feeling. You have to you have to have some idea. That when Mike Munger is on vacation, he might want to eat oysters, and so they're ready for you. Those restaurant people show every indication of being glad to see me when I come in the door. Are they glad to see you? I, they are, because I, I'm just a walking dollar sign. <laughs> Look, here's a big one. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I'd like to talk today about uh, competition and its role in two different spheres, the everyday sphere of, of markets and business that you're referring to in the in the restaurant example, and then perhaps a different sphere, the political sphere, where competition may play a different role. So I, I want to tell you a story and see if um, it has some application to, to, to politics. A friend of mine uh, changed jobs. He left the private sector and became a uh, high-ranking officer in a nonprofit foundation. It was a foundation that gives away a great deal of money. And when he made that career change, a friend of his told him, well, from now on, two things are going to be the case. One, you'll never eat a bad meal again. And the second thing is you'll never receive an honest compliment again, <laughs> meaning that once you're in a position where you're doling out money, you're going to have a lot of friends. People are going to want to look like your friend. They're going to want to encourage you to dole out some of that money to them. And I think you've got some experiences in the classroom uh, of a similar experience of uh, the doling out of money, and I'd like you to tell us about it. Well, the, one of the classroom experiments that I run is what I call the, the paradox of public choice, and it illustrates really what your anecdote says. Um, whereas in, in a market setting, the way to make money is to create new products or services and sell them at a low cost. The paradox of public choice is in government, the way to make money is to promise to give it away for free. Now, hang on. The way to make money in politics, the way to succeed in politics without really trying is to give away money for free. Is to promise to give away money ah. for free. It's going gonna, it's gonna to work out a little bit differently. Let me, let me give you the example and see what you okay. think. So it, in class, I call this the Tulloch Lottery. And the, named after named after Gordon Tulloch, the, the famous economist at George Mason University, who came up who's one of the people who came up with the idea of rent seeking and I think probably has the deepest understanding of how rent seeking works. So and it's, before we before you go into it, tell us a little bit about what rent seek what you mean by rent seeking. Well for an economist, a rent is something that is morally neutral. It's maybe good or bad, but it's a, a return over and above whatever cost you have to incur to get it. So it, it's a, a profit, but it's not a profit in the accounting sense. It's a profit over and above anything else that I could get. So the opportunity cost rate of return, and opportunity cost is something you and I have talked about before. So it's, a, it's a difficult concept for people to understand, but a rent is something that you get for free. It's something extra. So maybe a professional baseball player who's really good earns a rent because yeah. there's no one else like him. So I think, I forget who it was. I, I, I... I, it might be Larry Bird or it might have been someone else. I don't think it was Larry Bird, but someone in the NBA in the uh, in the 80s said, I love this game. I'd play it for a dollar. But he didn't have to because of competition drove up the value of his services to the team. Because he was the best. And so people bid up that, that service and what he got as a result was a rent. The the thing is that in in government or in my classroom example, what I can do is create a rent for free. What, what I do is I say, I'm going to give away 
Okay. And their eyes light up because a lot of students could use ten dollars. And but then I say, however you have to bid for it, and I'm going to give it to the highest bidder. It's a strange, little bit of a strange idea. You're bidding for a dollar for ten dollars. You're bidding for ten dollars, and whoever whoever gets the highest bid gets the money. And I, I really am going to pay it. I'm, I'm not trying to cheat them. Then there's a wrinkle. This isn't like the usual kind of auction where it goes to the high bidder. It has two parts. First, you put in an envelope the amount that you're willing to pay for the ten dollars. Second, you commit to pay whatever bid you make. Regardless. So suppose you bid seven dollars. That means you owe me seven dollars, whether or not you win. Okay. So in the in the case of a traditional auction where if you auctioned off ten dollars, people would presumably bid something close to ten dollars for the opportunity to get ten dollars. But because certainly that not would, more. Right. Certainly not more. And the winning bid we presu- re- assuming rationality, the winning bid would be under ten dollars and very close to it. Yeah, probably nine ninety nine. I would bid nine ninety nine for that, and so would everybody else. But that's in a normal auction where if you lose, you just shrug your shoulders, and the the, the quote winner of that auction pays nine ninety nine and gets the ten dollars and has a profit of a penny. Yep. And, but this and is, we, we kind of all break even, and it makes you wonder why we did it. But this is different. This is so different that it's confusing. People aren't sure how to approach it. There's two things, two big differences that I see. One is that. People, when they think about how much to bid, realizes, realize that there's no reason that 10 should be your highest bid. But the logic is, suppose I'm going to bid $9. I'm going to lose the $9 anyway. So I might as well bid $10. But if you're going to bid $10, I might as well bid 11 By bidding 11 I can minimize my loss. I bid $11, I win 10 I only lose 1 Whereas if I bid 9 and lose, I lose the whole 9 so there's nothing special about the $10 here. I might bid $20 if I'm trying to minimize my loss, if for some reason I have to bid. Right. Obviously, you could choose to opt out of the game if that were the case. I hadn't if... heard that about politics. The way I see politics, in <laughs> fact, and the point of this example is that I don't get to opt out. Right, because sometimes uh, if I don't win the auction, this strange auction called the political auction, if I don't win – uh, I might end up paying anyway, which of course is often what happens in a regulatory setting where if, if the regulation doesn't go your way, it's going to go again you. Yeah. It's going to go against you where you're going to uh, be punished by the regulation perhaps. Or well, by the... there's, there, there's, there's an old operation among uh, the mafia where somebody might come into your restaurant and say, this is a really nice restaurant you got here. It would be a shame if something was to happen to it. Right. The windows get broken. It gets yeah. torched at night. So if so, you've got a pretty nice industry and I can think of a new regulation, then I can get a significant part of what the cost of the regulation would be to you in terms of campaign contribution. Do you consider yourself a cynical person? I I don't consider myself a cynical person. I love all of humanity, and I actually think that most of humanity also loves itself. You know, I, I don't consider myself cynical either, I, I, and I'm particularly – and I'm particularly optimistic about life in general, which to me is somewhat uh, uh, antithetical to cynicism. And yet I find your example very appealing, which means that I have just found it appealing to compare a politician to a, uh, a thug. So a little bit – I'm a little bit alarmed. It, the, it, the, motives, the motives are different. I, I'm perfectly willing to believe that. The, okay. the, the public choice approach basically just extends the fundamental assumption of economics to the study of politics. The fundamental assumption of economics, people act in their own self-interest. In politics, if you believe that people act in their own self-interest, you don't necessarily mean that they're narrow and egotistical and grasping. They could be doing what they think is good for you. And as Henry David Thoreau said, if I knew for certain that a man was coming to my house to do me good, I would run for my life. <laughs> yeah, well, he was a prescient man uh, <laughs> and a wise one. Uh, so, so, the, so back to the classroom example. So, uh-huh. so you you offer up this ten dollars up for bid. If you submit a bid, you have to pay. Yeah. If you win, you get the ten dollars. If you lose, you have to pay what you bid. So, what do people? do in that setting in a classroom of, wh- of roughly what so- of what, what's the size of the classroom typically and what kind of bids do you get? Well, I, I do it in two stages. The first one, it's in a class of, of 18, so it's a fairly small class. But the rule is that they can't speak, they can't even communicate by wiggling their eyebrows. I tell them all to stare straight ahead and then just write this down in the envelope. I think you should put maybe a helmet over, a bag over their head or something <laughs> uh, during the game, but go they ahead. They keep wanting to put a bag over my head, but <laughs> that's a different story. Um, then the second, I also tell them after we do it once, I say, and next time we're going to do this again. 
but you can all email to each other, and whatever happens, happens. But I'm not going to tell you you can't communicate. So on the, on the first round, I'll often make $25, and that, out of that I have to pay the 10 So I net $15 out of the bids. So the average bid is, is a little over a dollar uh, in a class of 18. Yeah, well, a lot of people will still bid zero, but some will bid 10 or 11 A couple will bid 10 Somebody will bid 6 or 7 So there's a lot of variation in the yeah. first round. Well, it isn't clear what you should do. Right, it's very unclear. The second time, nobody will bid anything, or maybe they'll designate one person to bid a penny. The problem is in a in a, in a <laughs> class hang on that, hang on explain that okay you got eighteen people somebody sends out an email and they say everybody bid zero one of us bid one penny that person will bid the ten and then that person has one to per, go. That, that person will win the ten that person will win the ten and then the understanding will be they'll go buy some cookies or something and we'll all share so Very they, nice. they, they try to come up with a cooperative solution how's but, that work well in a group of eighteen it might work if they know each other in a larger group somebody's going to bid two cents. And knowing that, somebody's going to bid $0.03 cents or $5, and it'll unravel. So in, in small groups, just like Olson said, if we know each other, the transactions costs aren't very high, we can solve the collective action problem. In large groups, we never can, and someone's going to go and bid 10 or $11. Have you ever done the game in a large class? I, I haven't because I think it's, it's just clear what would happen. Yes. And in fact, we have enough examples from the U.S. Senate that I don't need to do it in class. Um, and what's the range of money you've made when you do it in a small class? Do you make 25? Is that normal? Yeah, I, I, I think the most I made was 40. Uh-huh. And yeah. what do you do with the money? I keep it. Uh, very nice. Do you, <laughs> do you run one of these every day? Or, um... <laughs> it actually would only work once because people will figure out that they don't have to play this game. And they that's can opt what, out. That's what's different from if you're an industry that's subject to threats of regulation. You don't have the option of opting out. So give us the uh, – what's – Extend this the, the metaphor of this game to uh, the political system. Well, I, I was at uh, Cato a couple of months ago and went for a walk along K, along K Street, which is the street that's the great temple to rent-seeking and political competition, I think, in the United States. And there's these beautiful buildings, very well-dressed, highly educated people walking along. And it suddenly struck me that these aren't so much buildings as they are bids in a telic lottery, because... All these industries, all of these groups that have lobbyists have to spend an enormous amount of money just to stay where they are. And if they try to get a contract, if they try to uh, either avoid regulation or affect the regulation that uh, is working on their industry, but fail, if they don't get the bill that they want through Congress, they don't get the bid back. They still spend all that money on the building and the air conditioning and the lobbyists with that excellent education and the very nice hair. And all the uh, all the dinners that they provided for the staffers and the and, Congress and all, all of those and, not very genuine compliments. Yeah, well, there's that too. The pain of keeping a smile on your face <laughs> while while lying through your teeth is one of the well, great they, costs. But like you said, the, the fact is, a lot of those lobbyists genuinely like people, but then fleas like people too. <laughs> well, now we've reached a new level. Uh, <laughs> we went from uh, politicians as thugs to lobbyists as fleas. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Lobbying, I, some of my best friends are lobbyists now that I've moved to the D.C. area. And, of course, many of them are passionately trying to advocate for a cause they care deeply about that, that they hope will improve the, the lot of humanity. And what they're doing matters. They would prefer not to have to participate in this telic lottery since they have. It probably is. They, they have to. It's unfair for me to criticize them. They're just playing the role of the, the game that the Congress has assigned. Them. That's what they've got. Yeah. And many – Many of them are fine people, and surely some of them are not, uh, no doubt. Uh, not my friends, of course. They're, yeah. all, they're all saints. But uh, speaking of saintliness, uh, what this suggests is that the legislative structure, the regulatory opportunities for Congress, uh, just as you're, you're a kind person, Mike. You know, you only run the game maybe at once or twice at the beginning of the year. You, you could, of course, run it every day and and – Explain, and I can grade them on how much they bid. Absolutely. You could explain that their grade depends on how wisely they bid and yeah. how cleverly they explain it and justify it. Well, it could be just on how often they win, which is subtly the same thing. Oh, that's then very they clever. Have to try. Right, which would be harmless uh, from the outside. You know, Professor Munger, uh, his class is about strategic behavior. And Here's the he, experiment. You have to do well. And he rewards his students for good performance. Yeah. Turns out there's something in it for him, too. Well, I'm, I'm – just a, an humble public servant. But you're, you're a kind enough person 
or perhaps uh, there's enough oversight at Duke, I don't know, <laughs> that you only do it uh, one time as an educational experience. Uh, people in Congress must find this temptation irresistible. Uh, so they are running these lotteries in some dimension um, all day long. I I think I have perhaps been too harsh. Let me put a different spin on it. Let's suppose you really think that the right thing to do is to get as much money as you can through HUD or other housing grants to cities in the United States that need it. And in order to make sure that the money's not misused, you have a competition to make sure that only the best proposals get funded. Okay, so, so wait a explain. HUD is the uh, Housing and Urban Development. Housing and Urban Development, and they, they, they run block grants. They run all sorts of grants. That to to have, help improve America's cities, right? They have the property, though, of being free money. Yes. They, have... they want to make sure that only the best cities give it, and so they don't give it at random. What they do is they give the best proposals. They read these proposals. It's competitive. They're, 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 they're peer-reviewed. They have experts look at them, and so it takes quite a while to prepare one of these proposals. A lot of guidelines, no doubt, to make sure it's, you know, up and on the up you and up. You want to make sure that, that these things are good. Yeah. Now, that seems like a good thing. Well, it's not. Oh. <laughs> it, <So. laughs> it's very difficult to do good. Maybe we should stop the podcast right here because at this point – You're about to cry. I can well, tell. And, well, I'm thinking about anyone who's listening out there. This is so disillusioning. I mean here's a program that – who could be against, say, improving a park or adding a museum to a city or some light rail, which you know, which, which will – make the city more attractive and cleaner. All these things are things that, that these cities compete for in getting federal money, right? Absolutely. And, 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 and it's, a lot, it's not just a crony system, you're telling me. To the contrary. It couldn't it's, be more competitive. It's competitive. You have to submit a bid. Of course, you could worry about whether the judging of the bids was fair or not. But Let's suppose it is. Okay. Let's suppose that it, it is fair in the sense that only the best, most well-developed, well-written proposals get funded. Do you really want our listeners to hear that this program doesn't work quite as well as it – oh, well, go ahead. Well, I've, my, my experience with this was in the city of Charlotte. I used to be the director of the Master of Public Administration program at UNC Chapel Hill. We trained city and county managers. And I went and visited Charlotte, uh, the municipal building, several times, and I, I heard – a gentleman that worked for the city of Charlotte at a fairly high level. This was in the mid-90s, so it was some time ago, and his name doesn't matter. But he said... And he shall remain nameless. He shall remain nameless. But he said, you know, I think we should get out of this HUD business. And first it struck me as strange to call HUD a business, because it, after all, it's a bureaucracy that gives away free money. He meant it in the colloquial sense. But... No, he actually meant it as a business, oh. because he saw it as they hired people whose job it was who's, minute, to write who's, better who's, proposals than other cities could write. Charlotte, the city hired people to, to write these. To write these proposals. Mm -hmm. Now, it used to be that a short proposal that just described the merits of the program would be enough, and Charlotte was one of the first cities to be successful at attracting HUD grants for, for housing, for low-income housing, for all sorts of housing projects. As time passed, though, other cities started hiring people also, and they had to write longer and longer proposals. So what what he described as this business that Charlotte was in was they well, had that's competition. You know that seems okay. It, it's exactly competition. It's just competition in a Tulloch lottery sense. Because if you write a proposal and you have three professionals and four staff spend six months on it, and you don't get the grant, you don't get the money back. Mm, that awkward. bid in that envelope just goes into the air. Yep. Nobody gets it. So what they found out was that a significant amount, nearly a quarter of the federal money that they were getting from federal tax when they when they did get the grants when they did get it so the total per year you look at the total grants per year that you receive they were spending a quarter of that money in city taxpayers money just to get it so it wasn't free it nothing's free you uh, can't give stuff away for free darn. that i think is the reason why public choice economists mostly stand alone at parties <laughs> Because it's not that people are evil or self-interested, even if they're doing their very best to do good. The fact is that the self-interest on the part of the, the enlightened self-interest on the part of the cities, these bureaucrats are not trying to get money for themselves. They're trying to get money for libraries and parks and new housing projects that will help low-income people. They all do it, and they end up dissipating more than the entire amount of the HUD grant. If 10 people apply for a million dollars, they may spend $2 million of city taxpayer resources in order for someone to win that $1 million of federal resources. The net, the system is worst off, and everyone has nothing but the best motives. That's a very um, – that's a fascinating example. Let me, let me give what I think is a different example of – what appears to be a related phenomenon, but I think is different. Maybe um, 
get your reaction. Uh-huh. Uh, sometime, I think it was, uh, I don't know when, maybe the early 90s, maybe the late 80s, but sometime in the last 20 years, Business Week started rating business schools, giving them a ranking, ranking the number one school in the country, the number two. And these rankings are inherently subjective. There's no real measure of, quote, the best or the 17th best. But as a result of those rankings, there was a lot more information available to students that wasn't there before. And as a result of that information, schools had to compete for students. And so they they actually improved the quality of the education. They also played to the test a little bit. You know, they tried to raise the things that Business Week rated schools on. And some of that was beneficial. Some of it may have been less beneficial than than we might hope. But I, in my experience teaching in a business school in the 90s, uh, business schools became much more competitive, worked much harder to make the environment that the students were in more pleasant, more responsive to their uh, desires, uh, higher quality education, better teaching, more practical as opposed to more theoretical when it was appropriate. And I think business education in the United States was greatly benefited by this improvement of, of information. But the difference between that example and the example of the HUD grants is that the bidding, the competition wasn't thrown away. It wasn't wasteful. The students who went to the universities that worked hard, all of them got better experience. Unlike the HUD grant where the losers, the people who weren't ranked in the top three grants, they simply threw away the money. Is that a good analogy Uh, in terms of what's different between the two? I've thought of a lot about that example, and I think it is a good analogy, except that one of the factors that the business school rankers used was um, the proportion of applications that were accepted. So the, the acceptance rate. The lower your acceptance rate, the better you are as a school. And what a number of business schools did was start sending information to um, colleges that had a lot of people where there's no chance those students were going to be able to get into yeah. Wharton, for example. Yeah. And so, but I still had to. I had to do the admission fee. I had to fill out the application, and everyone knew except me that I had no chance of getting in. So. Yes, the, the the information helped. Yes, many of those um, criteria were useful and probably did improve competition. But there is one aspect of a Tulloch lottery there because they're trying sure. to get applications that they know they're not going to be able to accept. And that's and it's also true of um, uh, in the marketplace. Sometimes a, a, a retailer or a restaurant, uh, a manufacturer will try some technique to make the consumers a lot better and it just fails. In the case, so not every every expenditure on behalf of improving your profitability is going to be uh, productive, but most of them ha- will be because if they're not, you have competition from others who do it better than you. I think well, Business Week in that case, Business Week faced competition from other rankers uh-huh. and eventually that probably got improved, although maybe not perfectly. Well, it's a, in fact, non-price rationing exists in all sorts of market settings, it's hard to get rid of it. I was, uh, I, I thought of you last night. I was in an ice cream store last night. I noticed they had some kosher flavors. They had mazel toffee and whaling walnut. I'm going to throw up. But yeah, <laughs> uh, not, not, from, not from the ice cream, but from the, the puns. So yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, right. I, I did think of you, though. And the I appreciate reason was that. that. I noticed that there was a really long line. And I noticed also that I was in this line of almost 30 minutes. I would have paid a little bit more to have avoided having to stand in that line. So why don't why doesn't everybody constantly change their prices to make sure that we don't have queues? Queues are inefficient, just in the same way that our example was about people sending in. Because I don't, I, it's basically a bid for ice cream. I'm saying I will bid more than this ice cream costs, but because I have to stand in this queue, um, it's all dissipated. Now, what I noticed that I thought you would be interested in was that line was always precisely the same length. And there was no reason because people kept coming in from outside. They would look. They would decide whether or not to stand in that line. And the the, the limiting factor was you could walk about a quarter mile to another ice cream store around the lake where there was very little line, mm-hmm. basically the same ice cream, but you had to walk a quarter mile. So the line was almost exactly always the same. And so the the way even that non-price rationing works in a market system is I have good information about how much it's going to cost me, and I decide whether I can use some alternative. Um, you may not have an alternative in uh, a government setting, and so as a result, non-price rationing like queuing or a Tulloch lottery doesn't have that same limiting factor. Let's go back to the ice cream store. Isn't so? You're, 
when you see a line like that, if there's a line like that every night, you always wonder why they don't just make the raise the prices a little a little bit. That's exactly what I want to know. Yeah. Using fact, using I shout that using time as a way to bid for something is inefficient because nobody gets it. Nobody gets it. You just throw it away. Yeah. It'd be better to have to pay in money. At least someone would get the money, and then competition could bring. Well, the, it'd be better for me because I have the money. You rich people always say stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> no comment, Mike. Uh, but in that situation. It could be the case uh, that someone simply uh, called in sick unexpectedly and the line just showed up and it's too expensive to, to change the prices that night, et cetera, et cetera, or they're in competition with that place around the corner and they're worried that if they change the price, they might uh, lose business and people get accustomed to the other store. I guess there are a number of reasons, but but uh, restaurants often um, are, are, quote, overcrowded and do use time. There is uh, there's some interesting literature on that. Maybe we can put a link up to it uh, uh-huh. on the on the um, on the website. Mm-hmm. Any uh, closing thoughts on uh, politicians and their um, uh, propensity to offer these uh, goodies up for sale? One, one thought I had is the IRS code, the Internal Revenue Service, the tax code, is a wonderful example of this. Uh, there's always this clamor for a simpler tax code, but uh, a complex tax code is a auctioneer's delight, isn't it? Yes. And the thing of people often blame the IRS or blame the bureaucracy, that the tax code is the result of this desire to be able to either give away free money or give away free tax benefits and then let people compete for it. So lobbyists and others aren't doing I, I guess the thing I would want to emphasize about the IRS code and about the other things we've talked about, it doesn't have to be true that anyone is acting badly. It's just that the government setting, the public setting, is one in which competition may not have the same good effects that it has in the market setting. So it isn't true that people that, that government is evil or people that work for government are, are, is evil, are evil. It, it doesn't have the same good properties that translates acting on your self-interest into the, the benefit of the community that markets have. Yeah, it's not the invisible hand. You get the invisible elbow uh-huh. in the ribs. Right to the invisible nose. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the other – or visible nose. The, the <laughs> other part that, that is uh, ironic about this is that people who want good government are always complaining about the ugly side of government, lobbying and uh, campaign uh, expenditures in, in but behalf. But are symptoms. They're not causes. Explain. What happens is we end up blaming the people who are bidding in the Tulloch lottery, not those who create the setting of trying to give away free money. So the lobbyist is just someone who has is presented with this situation. That's a symptom and not a, the underlying cause. The underlying cause is relying on government to provide all of these free services when it's impossible. It's not difficult. It's impossible. You can't give away free money. People are going to compete for it. Right. Not surprisingly, when when there's a large trough filled with goodies, the the pigs will fight to get at the stuff. And 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 being a pig doesn't make you a bad person. No, it's part of the deal. Uh, but if we wanted to improve it, I think the way to improve it is rather than lecture people that they shouldn't elbow and fight, uh, we ought to put less stuff in the trough and uh, let people compete elsewhere. Because not only because it it is is better or more moral, it just it absolutely will not work. It's just a little part of the fabric of reality. Well, Mike, thanks so much for a fascinating uh, set of observations on the world of politics and elsewhere. It was Uh, great. Let's do it again soon. Yeah, enjoy those oysters. Thanks. Take care.